All right, so today we will continue with the discussion on stretching Tanai model and discuss some of the details on how these models are constructed and analyzed. And then we will have one of the practical examples uh, that has been used in one of the projects. Okay, and we will discuss whether it is correct or not. I think maybe there's something we can improve in that solution. Let's talk about that. Okay. So let me just finish this first. So basically, strut and tie models, we call short STM, strut and tie models, is base, the basic idea is that we take a concrete structure and we convert that into an equivalent truss model. So we have to find that truss model in a concrete structure and then convert that into a model that you can analyze either by hand or by computer, like a truss. And that is basically that we have only ties and struts and nodes, three things left in the model. And important thing is nodes, because when the ties and, just like joints and truss, when you design a truss, you have to design three things. You have to design tension members, you have to design compression members, and you have to design joints. And fourth is the supports. So same way, when we design the concrete structures using the, the strutted tie technology, we also have to design three or four, four items. The tension, ties, compression struts, nodes, which is the connection or joints, and the support system. So we will look into them one by one. So basic assumptions, we already talked about it, section is fully cracked, concrete takes no tension, all tension by ties, all compression by struts, strut and tie provide a stable mechanism, ties yield before struts can crash, reinforcement adequately anchored, external forces applied at nodes, pre-stressing is, is a load in this case, and it is a load bound solution. So these are the basic assumptions that we use before we start any strut and tie model. So they must be all satisfying. If they are not satisfied, your model is not going to work properly and it is not applicable. So any, if any of these conditions is not valid, we will have to make some changes and I will give you an example where one of these assumptions may not be correct and then how we manage that. So we talked about it that you real trust and out of that we can remove the members which are not needed, like these two members are not doing anything, so we can remove them, so we convert that into a strut and tie model, dotted line is concrete, firm line is reinforcement. So we design them after we get the forces. So it's very simple. You convert that structure into a truss, you calculate the forces, and then you design the members. For example, you calculate the force in the tie, and you calculate the total reinforcement based on the strength of steel. And then you put that much reinforcement there, and you can distribute it. For example, Suppose you analyze and you find a force of 100 kN here and you find that the total reinforcement required here is let's say 2000 mm square or then instead of putting all of that in one location you can spread it in this portion. So it becomes like stirrups with a spacing. So in fact stirrups in a beam or a ties in a beam can be lumped together to form one big tie in a truss or one big tie in a truss can be subdivided in, into many stirrups because total steel between these two locations must be equal to this one. Doesn't matter its location. So that is a good way to convert a structure tie model into a normal reinforcement by distributing the reinforcement in a good area. So that helps to make things more constructible. So, for shear design of shallow and deep beams, for torsion design, and for design of pile caps, and for design of deep joints, so it has many applications, right? Different applications you can use. So these are all the applications in use. So you can see from here, many. Deep beams, torsion design, pile caps, and so on. D regions, brackets, and cobbles. And this is how the limits of the, these are the kind of limits 
of the diagonal members in a strut because the diagonal members are the one carrying compression from here to here. So if they are too flat, they will not work. So if they are too vertical, they are not very efficient, they are not effective. So we normally have a range of angle in which these will work best. And if that range is not followed, you add more members or you change the geometry. For example, you start here. Here you can see that the, this point is going, so this is not really a beam. If you, are, if you have a situation like this, this is going to be obviously, you, you don't need any design. The road is not going anywhere. It's just a block of concrete on two supports. There is nothing going on there. So the road will just distribute by itself. You don't need to worry about it. Second one is this one. This is the starting case. So this one is a hypothetical case. Should never occur in reality where the span of the beam is equal to the height of the beam. This is a block of, you know, square block. Nobody uses that. Okay? Maybe in some extreme cases in pile cap, but it should not, it's too big. Normally, that would not be the case. This is a starting case where we have a ratio of two between this and that. And here you see these red lines. These are the bounding lines where the compression strut should remain. So one angle is like 35 degrees, another one is 65 degrees. So something like that. Between 35 to 65 degrees is the best angle for the strut to form and transfer the load. 45 is the ideal one, of course, but not the most efficient one, not the most economical one. Most economical will be 35 or 33, something like that. But let's say we are saying, so here it's 45 degrees, as you can see, and this is, this is right in the middle, so this is a very good angle. But it should not be like this, so this is outside already, almost outside, and it should not be too flat. So when you go to this one, then you can see that the dotted line on the left hand side is just touching our limit. So this is borderline case. You can do it without the ties, vertical ties, or you can do it like this with one system of tie, right? Both of them will work, but this is a little bit borderline. So there's a chance that the shear could be a problem. This one definitely no problem. It's going to work perfectly. This is borderline. So if you want, you can either use the left side or you can use the right side in which you add, and as I mentioned, so here what will happen is that the load will go on this line and here it is, you need to take it back by tension and then it will go to support. So it takes, tick, tick, one step to go. Here it goes directly. Here two step, transfer. Here when you make it, so this is three. Ratio is three. This is ratio is four. So here it is outside the line, so it will not work. Here the starting time model will not work without intermediate load transfer, the beam will actually fail. So in that case you need to have this at least one member here so that you can bring this line back to 45 or something like that and then another one. This one definitely outside you need three members. This one too flat you need four members like that. So you can find the geometry of the truss based on the angle of these members not to go flatter than 35 or more vertical than 65 after that. So that is a good range. So 45 is a good good starting point, but of course not every time you can do it, but remain between 35 and 65 and you should get a good truss design. And this is how you can configure the truss to be designed. And once you calculate, then you can calculate the force here and you can distribute in this region. And here, this will be zero. Actually, there will be no force here. So you just need some reinforcement, shear reinforcement in this region, right? And here you will need the reinforcement from here to here. Here you will need reinforcement from here to here. Middle of course, not, and force will be different in each. In, in this for a single point load, it will be the same, but for uniform load, it will change as you go along, right? So if you're clear about this, then the basic problem is solved. This is another example of how the angle of the strut will affect the tension force in the tire. So the angle of the strut is going to, to affect the force in the tire and also the curtailment. For example, if it's a very long truss and I try to connect it like this, which is not good, but I could, right? I will get a lot of force here. So the 
tension here will be constant, right? Horizontal reaction from this one will be taken from this place to that place, and then it will be constant, very large force, which will be cause of that, right? <coughs> if I use one division, then the force here will be high, then it will decrease. So I can curtail reinforcement. In this case, I don't need to provide the same reinforcement, and the force will also will be smaller. If I go here, that force will be higher, then go down as we go to the support. So I can curtail the reinforcement. As we, if I use too many, then I'm wasting this one. Because for a point load, if you have one, it has to carry P by two. Correct? If I have two, each one has to carry P by two. If I have five, each one still has to carry P by two. So it is not efficient at all. So this one will be just most economical, just one, and you only need reinforcement here. This is best used by ACI 45 degrees. So this is the most efficient design. When this is the most easy design. This is the most efficient design. This will not work. This is too uneconomical in terms of getting the vertical balance between vertical and horizontal reinforcement. You can see from, from this diagram. This, of course, this is for one point load. Mostly, we use this for transfer girders where we only have one or two point loads. We don't use big beam concept or certain type for UDL. It doesn't make any sense because UDL is normally too small. We don't worry about that. It doesn't, for a beam like that big, UDL is not going to be a problem. Short span, big beams, UDL is not a problem. The unit of the self weight is not a problem. It's always the point load which we are worried about. So, also, which means that mostly we use the stretching time model where we have high concentrated loads. If you don't have high concentrated loads, this will not give you any advantage over other. So, don't try to use it for an ordinary beam with UDL. You will not get any benefit or any, you will just waste your time. Right? So, this is normally for heavy loads, point loads, and short beams, high beams, like that, right? It will be most beneficial. Also, you, I mean, you can use it for anything, but it won't give you any benefit. That is the point. So, that is why I'm saying that when we have one, one point load or two point load, we have to look at the efficiency of the design by looking at trying any configurations and see which one will work best. So, what are the possible failure mechanisms for a stretching type model? Number one, compression starts in they fail in compression, right? Or the thighs fail in tension, or the joints crush or fail, right? So when you design, you need to make sure that none of this happens one by one. Now, what is happening inside these so-called dotted line struts? They are not lines because it's concrete. Force is not going to go in one small line. It's going to spread around, right? This is how it is going to spread around. Let's say we have two point loads and one. This is the ideal strut that we are looking at. This is the real strut inside the concrete because St. Bernard principle was saying that if you apply force, after some, some time it will spread around. So it will try to spread and go back like this. So this bubble will form. And this is the one which is going to cause you tension. So the crack will appear along this line, which will be the tension, perpendicular tension, like a split cylinder, splitting the cylinder, right? So in this case, normally the shear can crack. So this will, if, if this is not good, the crack will come perpendicular to the, to the strut line, right? intention. And the size of the strut is a very debatable item that what should be when you make a model, what should be the size of the strut that I use for my analysis. And this is anybody's guess. And most people guess or assume this to be derived from the size of the support. So as you can see here, actual size of the column will determine the size of the strut to be used or actual size of the support will determine the size of the strut to be used. So you can estimate this one 
based on the size of the support or a column or a load right if it is zero weight this will be zero width also but nothing is zero width this has some width so based on that you can see from here from the angle you can calculate this width easily and same so and then after that inside it will actually happen like this so this is how it will work and for a UDL the struts will be like this but we normally don't use for UDL but if the UDL is really high you could use this concept if that is the case so that is the basic idea of the load flowing through the body and here again we are looking at it so it's a bottle shape thing it's a tie here that is the node that is the, the width you can calculate from that like this one so this tie is very very useful to estimate the size of the so normally we put some plates here or plates here and if the if we have a problem we can increase the size of the support to make the strut bigger right we can put some plates here or we can put a spray here so if the so we can always solve these problems by changing the support or loading size and this is the crack that will appear so actually inside we could form a separate truss inside each of the strut which will take the tension so we can put some reinforcement like this which is a confinement reinforcement so it becomes like a column Yes. So each strut actually becomes a column by itself because it is in compression. So just like a column, we can put the we can confine that concrete and increase the strength substantially. So by putting stirrups in this location like this, so we can put some small bars here and we can put some stirrups like this. So it will become like a column inside, like a column inside, like a column inside, and then put concrete around it, and that will become our strutting time model and an easy thing to design. So you might ask, why go through, through this all the trouble? Why not just put a steel member and a real steel truss here rather than doing all that? Absolutely, you can do that. And many people do that. So instead of using a concrete beam and then try to analyze a truss, they say, oh, what, you know, why? They remove that and they put a steel truss there. A lot of people use transfer girders in steel. But it has its own issues in terms of the connection with other members, and it has issues with buckling. It has local buckling. A lot of people don't like, uh, you know, to, to combine steel and, and, and concrete together. So they say, okay, concrete beam. You have uh, other advantages in, in, in there, some openings and other things. So people just and it's a also partition or division. So many reasons why people continue to use concrete for that. But you could use a steel. Right? Normally, we don't need these bars. These are required in an extreme condition when the loads are very high. So 90% of the time, concrete is enough to transfer the load by itself. You don't need steel inside. You don't need confinement. You don't need this kind of thing. That's why people prefer because it's economical. So, just to explain all of that again, so another way to look at that, another way to look at that, another way to look at that. So it's all explaining that this is like this, but actually like this. So you could model it like that and sub subtrust inside and then combine with that. So if you have a concentrated load, it varies like that. So it just gives you more explanation of what I have just explained to you. So struts. Compression struts can fail by many mechanisms, just like a column. They can fail by compression in concrete, bursting of struts at transfer tension, cracking of struts, buckling of struts. So these are the possible ways that a strut can fail. So we just need to make sure that none of this happens. Compression failure, almost impossible. And I will tell you why. Because the size of the columns are big enough, they are already designed for compression. And if you go back here, you will see that the, this column area, which is already designed for compression, this area, this area combined is always going to be more than that, no matter what. So it's impossible for the strut to fail in compression because the size of the strut is governed by the size of the support. And there are always two struts generally. Only at the support, it is possible that if this support, but as you can see, if this is the point load, 
support reaction will be half, half. So again, you get a smaller loading. So it's very difficult for strut to fail in compression, almost impossible. Second one is bursting of struts or transverse tension. This is quite possible. That's why we design for who? Reinforcement, confinement. And confinement can prevent this one. Crushing of struts, quite rare. Same as that, crushing of struts, quite rare. Buckling of struts, quite possible. If the beam is very big, it's quite possible for the beam to buckle before crushing. So we need to make sure that the buckling of the strut does not happen like a column. So it's a pin-ended column where you get the force and check the buckling load. You remember column, we, we talked about buckling load, PCR. You calculate that, make sure that it doesn't buckle. Right? You can use K equal to 1 in this case. So based on that, we can calculate. Prevention of failure, limit KL over R, limit compressive stress, confine the concrete, add compression reinforcement. So here, that is a problem, that is a solution. Right? So struts can be handled in this way. Normally, we do not have much problem with struts unless the load is really high. But sometimes the load are very high because you know these transfer girders are used to transfer 20, 30 floors of column load coming. Right? So it's, it's loads are quite heavy. Tension ties. These represent one or several layers of reinforcement and they may fail due to lack of anchorage. Biggest problem, inadequate reinforcement quantity, normally not a problem because you can always calculate and you can yield plenty of margin there. And anchorage is the key. You must prevent an anchorage failure, as I mentioned last time also. The concrete, the steel must be anchored well at the end, sometimes through mechanical anchors or plates. So that is what we are saying, that when we have a strut coming here, then you have the ties here, and these, this is, there is not enough, because strut is coming here, so the force is transferred to the tie here, and there is not enough length to anchor it. From the center of the strut to the end, there is no length. So we must produce, you, we must ex extend it, or we must bend it, or we must anchor it from here to here. So that is the available LD weapon length, which may be very small. And if not enough, we need to bring it out, put a plate here, or we need to bend them up. Correct? So anchorage of the tension reinforcement is very important, and that it must be calculated and must be checked. Anchorage length is not difficult to calculate. Normally, it is equal to 40 or 60 times the bar diameter, based on the concrete steel strength. And you calculate that, and then you make sure, really, if you don't have it, then provide mechanical anchor. So this is very important to make sure that these are anchored properly through bend, which is not good, or sometimes through a plate and bolts and the end. Then we come to nodes, the connections between ties and straps, or connections at the point. And here we can have these type of nodes. CCC, CCT, CTT, and TTT, right? Where we have three compression meeting at one location, two compression and one tie, one compression and two ties, and three ties. Some of them are impossible, almost impossible to, to create. Like three CC or three TT, you know, it's not practically possible. Most of the time it will be CCT or CTT type of nodes that you will have. One of them will be tension and one of them will be other two. So we can be say this is CCC, this is CTC, this is CTT and TTT. Right? So that, that is how you can see these points and these joints have to be then designed. So it's obvious how you design them. Here you need to check the triaxial compressive stress of concrete which is quite large compared to the ordinary. Because if you confine the concrete, because these are confining the concrete from all directions, so the concrete is becoming very strong. This one is pretty bad because all directions are tensions, so you must provide reinforcement anchorage or linkage between them. So this must be, so there should be a 
mechanism here, either a real node or enriched between the ties. Here, you have one tie, so the reinforcement must continue like that, and we must make sure that the, the concrete will not crush here. And here, we have two compression here, one tension here, so this must be anchored properly, typically support value, like this, right? And also, so we can see from here that these are not much difficult to consider. We have to basically look at the anchorage of the ties within the zone. That's the important thing. So we can see from here, prismatic, bottle, fan shape, these are the different types of trusses. The struts we normally assume like that, but we can also use that for heavy loads. And this one near the support or UDL, and these are the types of the nodes. So this is the total picture of the strut and tie issues. Hydrostatic nodes, so now you can see if it is a C, 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 it will look like this. If it is a, like this one, C and T, it will look like this. And if it's, so you have to make sure that the anchorage is achieved properly. So sometimes we can extend the beam beyond the support to get the anchorage, or move the support a little bit to this side to get the anchorage, or we put the plate here, or put the plate here. So there are many ways to handle these things. So these are all, you know, there's a lot of material available for you to look at, but basic concept is very simple. Make sure steel is anchored properly, enough development length or mechanical anchor. And concrete will not crush, which normally will not crush. And concrete does not buckle, that's very important. This is to show you how the location of the least reinforcement can change the center lines of the, or the location of the reinforcement should match the center line of the member that you're using, right? This is quite important because center line of the actual reinforcement and the center line of the tie should be matching. If they do not match, then you have a problem. So that is why we can see from here that if this is like this, if this if the tie is here, the angle will be like this. If the tie is here, this will be become like this, and the angle can be like that. So we can actually, but look at this one. You can actually change the size of the struts by moving the reinforcement also. Right? right, because you change the angle within the, the beam. So, by distributing the tension reinforcement, you can actually solve the problem of the strut, also of, the, of the compression strut also, because it becomes wider. Rather than meeting at one small point, it will meet at a bigger location. So the joint size becomes bigger, so the strut becomes bigger automatically. So you can use these kind of concepts to control some of the problems in the Strikes. Again, the same thing, explaining again, one bar, it will be like this, if you distribute the, the tie, so this is the tie force, if you distribute it in this location, this node becomes bigger, you solve many problems, right? So some engineers prefer to distribute the, the reinforcement in a certain depth, not put all in one layer. It helps to distribute the tension better and it reduces cracking. So as you can see here, the only drawback is that if you move the T here, you will lose the angle and this, the force may be a little bit long, a little bit higher, right? Because if the, T, the force is here, the angle will be different. If the force is here, the angle will be different. So that's why we can play around with these kind of things to solve the problem. The problem is that we need to make sure that struts are stable. We do not have anchorage problem. Another advantage of using this concept is that you can use smaller bars which require smaller LD. So you can anchor them. Rather than using one big bar, which requires long development length, you put many bars there of smaller diameter, so you reduce the, the, the development length, so it is easy to anchor, right? So many problems can be solved by distributing the reinforcement in the tension zone. 
right? This is more about development and more about the nodes. You can just read this slide. I don't need to explain much, but just giving you more detail how you can calculate this, the size of the strut from the size of the column. You know, actual practical tips on when you do the real design, how you will proceed. How to use this model? So now we know the concept. The concept is simple. Ties, struts, connect them together, you have a stable mechanism. How to actually use it and some steps for you to do that. Number one, draw the beam and loads in proper scale. But this one is geometry. So you cannot just draw a beam like a center line. The beam must be drawn in its actual size columns must be drawn in actual size, everything must be drawn to the scale on a drawing because this is not center line thing, this is geometry. So geometry must be correctly drawn in proper scale to get the right feeling of how it's going to work. This is a physical phenomenon, so looking at it physically is very important. My, one of my books, I'm, I'm now writing on this strut and tie, is called Physical Modeling of Structure Through Strut and Tie. That means you look at the structure on physical dimensions, physical size, and try to create a model. Then draw primary strut and ties by connecting the supports with the loads. See if that works. It may or may not work. Right? Sometimes if it's a simple problem, it may work. Complicated problems, it may not work, but start from there. Draw the center of the loads to center of supports and see if that is already a truss or not, as you have seen before. Strut angle between 35 to 50 degrees, as I mentioned earlier. Each strut must be tied by ties, right? The strut and ties model must be stable and determinate. Doesn't have to be, it can be determinate. Some, some cases it may be determinate, but if it determinate, it's good. You can solve by hand. If not, we use computer. Assume dimension of the strut and ties. Not critical right now, but you can use the column sizes as a basis. Right? Use the same column size as the size of the strut and ties to start with. Make trust model in any software and analyze or by hand. Right? And design truss members, design lead bars for tension members, and check capacity of compression members like columns. So for the purpose of analysis, assume the main truss layout based on beam depth and length, initial member sizes, as I mentioned already, use frame elements, and generally single diagonal is sufficient, and if the floor beams and slabs can be connected directly to the truss members, elastic analysis may be used to estimate. So basically, you create that truss and you do the analysis, elastic analysis, and then it can be actually part of the bigger model also. Sometimes, and this is something that is very important, which I don't know if you did in your project or not. You cannot take this, or I mean, you can, but it is better to put this truss model in the main structure also, because if you analyze the main structure using the, that beam and you use the, the truss for your design, then you may have incompatibility between the two. So if you put the truss directly in the big model, you can get the forces correctly, and also the deformations will be correct. But if you take it outside and apply the force, then the deflection of the truss will not change the forces of the... But this can be done, one or two trials. So either way, you create the model, and then you either separate model or in the main model. Main model. Some researchers suggest using finite element model to determine stress trajectories. As I mentioned earlier, one, one of our student did that. So you can also use the, you know, in the, in the SAP 2000, you can model the deep beam by using many shell elements. And from that shell element analysis, you can see the stress trajectories. And from that, you can estimate the direction of the 
struts and ties because it's a good way to do that, right? So it depends on how you proceed. Now, we can make good trusses and bad trusses. This is a good truss, compression like this. But you could also make a truss which looks like this. That you say, say no, no, I don't want that. I want the ties to be diagonal and I want strut here. This is also stable. This is also going to work. But this is illogical, right? You could do it, theoretically. But it is going to, it's going to go against the elastic behavior. So when you do this, it will not fail. What will happen is it will crack. It will crack a lot. But after that, it will become stable. Because you have enough reinforcement, you have compression here, so it won't fall down, but it will have cracking here, and it will have cracking along here. So it's not the best of things, but it can work. So just because it works does not mean it's good. It has to be logically matching with the elastic behavior. Similarly, this is an extreme example. This is a continuous beam, right? This is common transfer girder in many buildings. So you could say that I'm going to have these two point load here, and I'm going to use uh, two struts here and one tie here, and I'm not going to use anything here. Well, of course, it can work. It's like a Right? Cantilever from the central column and all the load going to the central column. You can assume that, but reality is not like that. So it will work, but it is incorrect model. Incorrect in the sense it is not logical, it is not matching with the elastic stress distribution. So in reality, the load will try to go here, not a fracking here, and and it will be not correct. Secondly, you could assume that I'm going to use two struts like this and I'm going to design two separate struts like this right two beams I'm not going to connect it here yes of course it will work but then you will have a lot of cracking here in negative reason so the right model is going to be like this and the size of the struts should match with approximately the forces going through in each direction so this is the correct model for that problem other two models, although stable and although satisfy all of the requirements, not so good. So engineering sense is very important. That is why people say that we should look at the elastic analysis result and get the idea from there. Don't make the trust which is not logical, which is not elastically compatible. Right? So you understand. Good and bad trust. Pile cap is, in fact, pile cap is the starting point of this strutting time mechanism. The first thing that people start to apply is the pile cap. And we also started 20 years ago in the design of the pile cap for this bridge that I mentioned to you last time. And the reason is that the pile cap is not a beam, it's not a slab. Pile cap is a strange animal. Because the size of the pile cap, length, both direction and thickness are of the similar order. For example, 3 meter by 3 meter by 1.5 meter. Now this is not a slab because normally 3 meter by 3 meter <coughs> slab should be 10 or 20 millimeter or 30 millimeter, maybe maximum 200 millimeter. But this is 1.5, 1500 millimeters. So which means this is not a slab. It is also not a beam. So it's a block of concrete. The question is how the forces are flowing through this block of concrete. What can explain that? And people found strut and tie to be one explanation. So this is the simple strut and tie that people use. And this is the modification that we invented. I'm saying invented, that we proposed, right? And then I will tell you now, explain to you why this and that, what is the difference between them? This is what you will find in every book. That the pile cap or the beam should be designed like this, that you have a column and then you connect the center line to this one and then you put it. Now my question is, first of all, there is also a lot of bending moment on the column. 
Where is the bending moment going now? Because you cannot apply bending moment to a truss node. It's a pin-ended pin mechanism, right? So what happened to the bending moment in the column? Somehow, everybody forgets that there is a bending moment in the column coming here. Especially from earthquake forces, or wind forces, from any forces. And many times the bridges are eccentric. You have a lot of bridges with eccentric bridges. So you have bending moment coming to the pipe cap. So what are you going to do about bending moment in this case? You cannot apply it. Secondly, if the column is small or big or big, the thrust remains the same, so tension force remains the same, which is also not correct. Because when the column becomes bigger, tension should become smaller. And suppose the column is the same size as this one. So in reality, there should be no tension. But your, this model will continue to give you the same tension, which is not logical. So we propose a modified form of the strut in which instead of one node, you put two nodes and be close to the edges of the column where the actual compression and tension are transferred. Right? So we say, okay, this load is coming, half is coming here, half is coming here. Now, if you apply a bending moment, then that bending moment can be converted into forces, which can now be applied to these nodes. And then now, and now if you change the size of the column, forces and tension will change also. So now the truss is compatible with the column size and also can handle bending moment, right? So this is, we call it modified truss model, not the conventional one. So this is what we use all the time now, modified, not the single node model, but multiple node model for supports and loading. And here you can see that the force, if you calculate for this particular case, force is 1,900, here force is 4,500 for this particular case. So which means you are almost getting half the force in this case than you will get in this case. Much difference in the economy of reinforcement. And these pile caps are normally many in a bridge. So saving could be very large. So that is why the column size and normally bridge, bridge piers are very big. They are not small, 2, 3 meter, 4 meter. They're not, so you can imagine this is 5 meters. The bridge pier is like this from here to there. How can you think that is a point like this? That's not a point. That's a huge piece of concrete. So it must be represented by two or actually four nodes in 3D. So if you take this idea to 3D, it should actually look like that. So if there's a column here, the forces will go to four corners like that through the through the concrete. This is from the SAP model, right? So you can study the analysis, and basically, it will come like this. So in a pile cap with one column, four piles, the load will transfer in these planes like that. Each plane with this truss and load. Truss. Now you can handle by axial bending, axial moment, axial force and column size and the truss will adjust itself. And this will be much more realistic than single point model of a column. Right? Of course you need a program to solve this but it is easy. You can just create a 3D model of a truss and then you can convert that to analysis. So this is very important that we understand the sizes of the members that will affect the forces, right? And we present them or transfer the forces at the right locations. And we should be able to handle bending moments as well as exit forces. And even shear forces, because now you can apply horizontal forces at any location also for the shear to be transferred, right? Or torsion. So all forces are now possible to be applied to this model. Now, very important point is how do you model the support of the truss? So modeling pin, roller, spring as actual members. 
you have these choices. Obviously, this is the best one. You should model it as real as possible. If you convert to Spring, you might make some mistakes in how the Springs are done. Roller is incorrect. Pin is incorrect. So, as members, as actual members, as far as possible. Unless you know how to do it, convert them into Springs. Right? Both of these are not real. Unless you provide real rollers and real pins in a steel structure, which is possible. So I give you the, the example, so I try to create several models to show you the difference. This is a pile cap with two columns and six piles and we analyze it using springs, the tension and using pin, zero tension and using roller, some tension, some none. So both of them are wrong in 3D. This is the only one which is correct, right? So spring or real members. So if you, if you make a mistake of using pin, it's, it's totally wrong. So piles are not, piles need to be modeled and soil needs to be modeled. You cannot stop your model at the base of the pile cap. So that's why we put springs, vertical and horizontal springs need to be put. Otherwise, you will not get the correct behavior. And that's how you can model different kinds of pile caps. One pile, two piles, one column, uh, four piles, and then two, one column. And similarly, you can create all kinds of models with bending moment, with axial load, right? So we did a lot of work on pile caps many years ago when designing the pile cap for one of the bridges. So all of this came from that research. So you can create all of these kind of models for different pile caps, even very long ones or transfer builders. So in 3D, they look like this. This is already now 20 years old. Yeah. The bridge is also now 20 years old. But you can see here, different piles. Three, many. This is the real, actual pile cap in that bridge is like this. Actual pile cap, they have two columns on that one, and a very long pile cap, and 12 piles below that. And the pile cap is much bigger than this room. Yeah, this one I would like to show you. This is the result of that thesis that the student did last time from Sri Lanka. And he used the print. So basically, this is a SAP model. We convert that, and from that, we got these stress trajectories. And you can see the stress trajectories directly give us the direction of the starting direction of the struts and ties and based on that then he converted that into strut and ties. So he did that for that, also for pipe caps, using actual piles and actual things, for bridge piers, these are from the real bridges in Bangkok. So he tried to extract the strut and tie from finite element models. Okay. We stop here.